we really have to look at what has happened in a region like Shenzhen over the last 30 years. What we know best about Shenzhen is large-scale contract manufacturing. Companies like Foxconn, Taiwanese contract manufacturer that produces for companies like Apple. But at the same time, what happened as these grew in size, as these large contract manufacturers grew in size, was that a, what, it was, uh, what was at first a very, very small practice of entrepreneurs began taking shape. So these were people who saw a gap in the global economy to emerge. So they started their own factories, started partnering together to then design devices that the big Western corporations uh, weren't doing yet. So for example, the early cheap smartphones that came on the market were designed by these kinds of informal entrepreneurial manufacturing practices. And they were mostly designed for a niche market, so migrant workers in China who couldn't afford an Apple iPhone or uh, industries in Africa, in uh, India and so on. So these were basically um, markets that hadn't really been tapped yet by the Western counterparts. But this all happened in a kind of half formal, half informal economy that developed in the shadows of the more familiar story of Apple and Foxconn. And it is exactly this informal manufacturing culture that today draws makers and creatives from Europe and the West to China because it's a, it's a culture that really um, constitutes a practice of openness applied to manufacturing. It's, it's exp constant experimentation with new ideas and a lot of the makers and tinkerers from the West see a lot of themselves in these kinds of entrepreneurial practices in manufacturing. What we've seen happening over the last 10 years, and this was really sort of at its peak in 2008, was that uh, other kinds of devices came out of Shenzhen. Uh, and this ranged from things like copycat iPhones, affordable iPhones, people, you know, cater towards people who couldn't afford the actual iPhone, but also new creations included phones like uh, a phone that would come in, that would come equipped with eight built-in speakers. So this was a phone that was designed specifically for construction workers so that workers could listen to music while they were on the construction site, or included phones um, that c came in interesting shapes, like a phone that was shaped like a car, or a phone that was shaped like a Hello Kitty. And these were often small batch productions, catered for particular niche markets. And so in the beginning, these were um, a kind of like these companies that produced them, um, tested out the market, which, which product would fly. And over the years, what came out of these sort of experiments was actually a big industry. So uh, today, Shenzhen uh, produces, for example, uh, products like the Techno mobile phone. The Techno mobile phone is um, a leading phone brand in Africa and uh, is designed specifically for the African market. So if you look at the advertisement of the Techno mobile phone, it reads um, that it comes equipped with a particular camera that captures dark-skinned subjects, particularly while in low-light conditions. So this phone was specifically designed for, for a non-white audience, right? And this is a huge market, you know, it's a big market, it's a billion dollar industry of shipment between not just the West and China, but really these other markets in Africa, India, Southeast Asia, Latin America. And you see anything there now, you know, from smartwatches, mobile phones, the famous hoverboards, you know, the, that were discussed heavily in the West, uh, tinkering, you know, with new health devices. Um, and you, so, so you see a range of phones, but it has really moved way beyond just a couple of interesting sort of copycats that were, you know, sort of unique combinations between an Apple phone shape and an Android operating system, right? It has really turned into a big professional industry at this point. People there, you know, really try to position their work as a counterculture to top-down consumer culture. And uh, this has, you know, really happened both on a hobbyist level, but has also turned into its own industry. So making itself, you could argue, is its own industry now, you know, where people sell maker kits and uh, maker kits are used in education to help um, students and young people learn about the inner workings of technology. But it has really sort of been driven by a kind of hobbyist uh, practice. Now, the same exists in China. So there is maker spaces and hobbyist hacker spaces uh, in China and that really started taking shape around 2007, 2008 and 2009 when these first ideas around DIY making 
as much as they were on the rise in Europe and the US, were also on the rise in Asia and also in China. So similar kind of practice in both China and the US, you see you know, the kinds of people who are attracted and who spend time in maker spaces. You know, these are people who have better income, who have higher education. Um, these are people who can afford to spend their free time in a maker space and just play and have fun, right? So same happening so in, in both regions. What is different about China is that it has at the same time also a maker culture that really grew out of a kind of making out of necessity spirit. So what you see when you go into any Chinese city, so not just Shenzhen, but really most Chinese cities, um, you can find little shops that repair your phone or your air condition. Pretty much any kind of device that you have is easily repaired. There's a whole infrastructure of making out of necessity a repair culture that's mundane practice where people make a living off of it. And that goes all the way from street level repair and tinkering culture to, of course, manufacturing, which is then a large scale kind of mass production culture, right? And everything in between with like small prototyping facilities. So in some ways, you know, you and this has been in place, as I mentioned earlier, for the last 30 years, right? So there's a kind of maker culture that developed in parallel in China, but it was always driven by a kind of intervening in, in the status quo by necessity, right? By people who were eager to make a better living for their families. So a lot of people who came to Shenzhen as migrants, they were really driven, you know, to make something out of themselves. Uh, so these were people who came with nothing, you know, and started out working in manufacturing. And some of them managed to work themselves up and start their own companies. And so this is a kind of, it's a, you know, it's a very mundane form of making that isn't driven by the same ideological uh, principles of counterculture. While at the same time, you have, of course, also, you know, a younger generation in China who is, who was, um, you know, raise a kind of in a middle class kind of lifestyle and they too subscribe to similar principles as Western makers. But in China, both still exist at the same time and they interact. So you now see a lot of companies uh, that have emerged in Zhenzhen over the last um, seven years who basically position themselves as intermediaries between the Chinese manufacturing and mundane, you know, making out of necessity maker culture and the more global hobbyist maker culture. So this is companies like Seed Studio, for example, who helps makers who don't know much about manufacturing but are fascinated by it, translate and bridge into manufacturing. So this has become its own business in China now that people are translating and bridging between these two maker cultures. In, I think this was in 2010, I was doing field work, ethnographic research in the hackerspace in Shanghai. And there was a group of people who was experimenting with swarm, swarm robots. So swarm robots are basically these tiny robots that aren't very intelligent, each one of, each one of them, but together they're, they're smart and move together and can coordinate. And they built these robots and entered an international competition on robotics and actually won second prize. Uh, right in between Harvard and MIT. So this little hacker space in Shanghai that was just around for a year had managed to actually win an international competition. So it just shows you in some ways what is possible, right, in terms of a success story. But then you also see new partnerships um, um, evolve. So what I've seen a lot happening more recently over the last years is that um, maker spaces and hacker spaces and other kinds of experimental spaces begin working with politicians and bureaucrats social workers, policy makers, to intervene and establish structures of how people, how other people get access to work. But it's actually new relationships that are being built between people who shape the city in policy and government and people who know much about technology and engineering and designs. So there's new alliances being forged. And I find it really interesting when we think about what comes out of these maker spaces isn't just technological innovation, but it's also social intervention and in some ways even political intervention and that's that's really interesting i think